Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com. Um, information services, activities for people who work in the global medcoms community, by which I mean medical communications, medical education, medical publishing. Um, and at the moment, we're running weekly webinars um, and recording them and putting them on Network Pharma TV, where you can find, uh, well, there's now 250 videos at Network Pharma TV. So there's a really great resource there building up. But these webinars are great. It means we can bring in speakers from um, literally around the world and an audience from around the world, talk about topics of interest in medcoms. Um, and today we're going to be talking about clarity in medical communications. So um, I'm going to simply hand over to Jason, um, who is going to introduce himself in the panel and talk us through a presentation, which will be followed by a Q&A session. Um, so please, audience members, um, text your questions, observations, comments in using one of the text boxes. So Jason, over to you. Thank you. Fantastic. Let me just activate this. Hopefully you, you can see that now. So thank you, Peter. Uh, we've been talking about clarity in our medical communications for ages now, but um, I don't think there's a better time than now in the current digital age of us turning all that talk into reality. So what we'd like to do today is stimulate some discussion with you around the risks of misleading communications, um, and around opportunities that we can seek to improve clarity in our communications uh, through effective written communications and also data visualization. Um, there we go. So my name is Jason Gardner. I'm the head of scientific services at CMC Connect and I'm gonna cover off the written communications elements. And then I'm gonna hand over to uh, my co-presenters who are gonna talk through data visualization. If I could just ask, Katie to say a few words of introduction. Yeah, hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Demery. I'm Scientific Engagement Director and I work in one of the functional excellence teams within Global Medical Affairs here at uh, Novartis in Basel. Um, and part of my remit is to provide guidance and frameworks to our franchise teams who actually work um, on our assets and on our brands uh, so that they, they know what they need to do in terms of all things med ed um, and publications and so on. Thank and you, I'm, Katie thank and Orla. Uh, I'm Orla Weir. I'm Multi-Channel Strategy Director at CMC Connect. Um, I work with Jason and team, and I work across a number of different channels um, trying to enhance communications and communication skills. But my main focus is probably on digital. Thanks, Orla. Right. So it's true. Science is getting harder to read from obscure acronyms and unnecessary jargon. It's becoming ever more impenetrable. Um, and that's even for scientists. I guess there's sort of an overcomplication of language that's really risk of creating a barrier to science, to communicating science, and therefore to understanding science, and therefore to advancing science. Um, but the trouble is, it's not only at risk of alienating, well, it's also at risk, sorry, of alienating um, non-scientists and the media. And that could at worst mean lack of understanding uh, and uh, uh, what well, best lack of understanding and at worst mean that the data is misinterpreted and and and, and taken forward and um, used inappropriately. Uh, so this is to actually show that the drastic reduction in readability over time it's stark. This is the flash reading ease score of more than seven hundred thousand. Um, abstracts over the time period that you see and it's a, a clear reduction in over th in 30 points or so out of the 100 but it's not just readability it's also the average number of words in titles and abstracts that's increasing over time and continues to increase over time and it's also acronym use we love a good acronym don't we we're slapping them into our abstract titles and into our abstracts it's and it shows no sign of plateauing there either but it's not just about the complexity, it's also about the content that we're writing in our medical communications, that we're also at risk of misleading readers. So this is a few slides just to show some data we presented at the uh, ISMAP annual meeting this year, report, uh, showing a disconnect between the um, lay media headlines and their associated scientific um, source titles published in the journals. So just to give you an example of what I'm talking about here, on the left, you see a lay media title talking about treating cystic fibrosis patients. Wonderful, brilliant. But on the right, you see the source 
scientific title that it's derived from. It's in ferrets. So they clearly screwed up somewhere in the lay media um, headline. But it's, we also found in this research that it's not just the lay media that's at fault, it's also the scientific article titles that were often misrepresenting the study population. In fact, if you see on the left, a third of the scientific source titles incorrectly inferred that it was a human population. And half of the papers we looked at on the right um, actually omitted the study population completely. So that could be contributing to misleading late media headlines. Well, so what can we do about this? Um, many of you might know that I'm a big proponent of plain language summaries. If we can talk in plain language, in addition to our scientific technical language, then that's going to help uh, audiences better understand the science and better communicate that on appropriately. So I just want to make you aware of an initiative that um, I'm co-leading with Dawn Lobben from Envision Pharma Group and Rob Matthias, who's the CEO of ISMAP. And what we're aiming to do in this project is understand different stakeholders' perspectives and try to identify the barriers and drivers to the uptake of plain language summaries. And hopefully this can help inform other initiatives like the ongoing GPP-4 guidelines. So look out more uh, for, for more of this project um, in the near future. But it's not just plain language summaries that we can use. We've got other tools at our disposal as well. So here are listed a few. I'm not gonna go into all of them. In fact, we can talk about them later in the Q&A if you want to. But what I do want to do in the rest, as what we do want to do in the rest of the presentation is to focus on the last one listed here, the data visualization element. And for this, I'm going to hand over to Katie to tell us more about it. Katie. Thank you, Jason. Um, so if just go to the next slide. So, um, so really, what is the role and value of um, visual communication? Well, uh, if you just go to the next slide, um, you know, the days of waiting for your print journal to turn up in the post are, are long gone. I'm sure some of the older ones amongst us can remember, you know, going off to the university library or the library in our company um, offices to try and find some, some reference that was printed several years ago and, and going through those files. But um, um, you know, in the age of technology and the huge amount of research that is undertaken in institutions, hospitals and in the pharma industry worldwide, we now have two and a half million scientific papers published every year, which is one every 12 seconds. How is anyone supposed to keep up to date and um, keep on top of this? It's absolutely overwhelming. Um, next slide, please. Um, so really, you know, when you can't really read all of that information, it's completely impossible. Um, but our brain relies on um, mental shortcuts to be able to process information, to be able to take information away um, quickly. Um, certainly, we're all here scrolling on, you know, um, iPhones, iPads, and so on, scrolling through Twitter, and you need to have something that catches your eye. And so that you don't have that mental waste, so you don't have all of that clutter. Um, and it's our job as communicators to try and ensure that the information that we really need to get through is the information that's retained. We need to make that really relevant and clear and, and appealing and to sort of really cut down on all of that mental, mental noise. Although I will say, don't we all remember some hideous, uh, you know, one hit wonder from the 1980s that just seems to clutter up brains. Um, and, um, you know, you still remember all of those things and sometimes you can't remember what you went to the fridge for. So um, it happens to all of us on, on every level. And we have to try and make sure that we as communicators are, are, are putting out the right information so that it's, um, it lands correctly. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm just going to talk about a few um, principles of um, the effective communication. Um, so really, anything that's presented visually accelerates the comprehension and increases the chances of um, the person actually retaining that information. So we process um, images about 60,000 times faster than text. So we've all he heard the old adage of a picture is worth a thousand words and never has it been more true. Uh, a picture might be the thing that draws your attention and makes you click and makes you want to learn more. Um, and that's where it can really have um, an impact. So if you just click onto the build, 
Um, so about 90% of the information that is um, transmitted to the brain is, is visual. We've got more receptors to, to deal with visual communication. Um, that's what we're geared up to do. And if we also uh, see information as well as hearing it at the same time, then we're more likely to retain that over a longer period. Um, I think um, in these in these sort of um, COVID times, I think what's quite interesting is, you know, there's memes and things flying around, I'm not saying you're going to change all of your data into into memes, but it does tell us a certain something about what catches the eye and and how short communication can really help people to, to get a message. Next slide, please. OK, um, actually, we can go to the next one. OK, so um, just a few uh, pointers on how we do this in practice. So really need to understand your your audience and what level of information they're able to, to absorb. Uh, what do they really need to understand? You, you might know what you want to say, but what do they actually need to, to understand? What message can they take away from the information that you give them? And clearly, if you're talking to a physician specialist, they, they have certain ways of understanding information. They're very familiar with graphs and so on, but let's try and make that message as easy as we can uh, for them to understand. And as Jason's already alluded to, uh, we're working on things like publication, plain language, language summaries and we're trying to bring science to an audience at a level that they can understand that a level that, that they want to interact with so if you click through we then have a suggestion of you know that same information presented in a different way um, but would be acceptable to um, a lay audience or, or a patient and taking into consideration the, the average reading age and so on um, okay so next slide um, it always helps if we can provoke uh, an emotional response. Um, and we're going to use a few examples here from, from COVID. Um, so clearly the CDC wanted to create something that, that really packed a punch um, and really demonstrated that the coronavirus is real. The colouring that's used, red for danger, grey, it looks a little bit ominous, um, really helps to, helps to make this real to people. I think probably we're going to benefit in these times that who do you know the lay public never heard of cytokines until now but now they do they understand a little bit more science hopefully than than they did before okay so um next slide please um so having decided that you're going to have this amazing uh visual um how how do you actually um use that in reality so you really need to customize your visuals for the context in which they appear we talk a lot around multi-channel engagement and omni-channel engagement um but the visuals need to be um customized to ensure that they're um, they're in the right context and that they'll work in every situation so will they work on their own as an image or do they need extra extra explanation or is there going to be a voiceover so you need to think about how the materials that you produce can be used in all of those different different contexts and I'll come on a little bit uh, later into how we do that as well okay next slide please um, so trying to be consistent so having shown you the uh, imagery from CDC um, they've clearly used their their imagery uh, all over the place through a lot of different types of uh, materials. So when something is memorable like this, it starts to become iconic. Um, and you see that when these things get redrawn for, you know, in memes and so on. So people, people understand what it looks like. They, they, they get the, they get the information very, very quickly. Um, and I think probably we're used to seeing this type of implementation, particularly across marketing materials and, and sales materials. Um, but we don't always see that um, done consistently uh, throughout medical materials, which of course, most of us are involved with. I work in medical affairs, and I'm sure um, as agencies, colleagues most of you are working on um, medical education materials um, next slide please okay so um, how do we make it consistent and persistent well to be, to be honest you really need to start early so next slide so right from the early stages of starting to talk about your your molecule of medicine your your asset that's in development um, how that works what the mechanism of disease is and then through into into how how it works and the efficacy um, it really helps if you can start to get some kind of consistent and persistent visual communication i'm not saying it's necessarily easy um, but if you can then have that recognition then your brands become icon iconic and it helps them to be leaders in the market right from launch now clearly uh, next slide please 
um, sometimes it's a little bit difficult. We, like I said, we're used to seeing this in, in marketing, um, but what we have uh, found is that sometimes you have lots and lots of different touch points with HCPs and wider audiences uh, where, um, you know, things get redrawn all the time. I'm sure as agency colleagues, you've been asked to, to redraw materials. Now, you know, it, wouldn't it be helpful to your audience? The HCP maybe sees, you know, multiple people from a pharmaceutical company. They might interact with an MSL. They might interact with a CRA. They may be interacting with sales reps. And whilst we have to be very clear on the intent, obviously, of when something is medical education and when something is uh, commercial and in a sales situation, the science doesn't change from one thing to the next. So why change how your antibody looks or how your cytokine looks or your B cell or your uh, blood vessel and so on? So uh, really helpful to understand what your audience needs to understand. Maybe, maybe it's you're in an area where they know lots about asthma, for example, already. Um, but you need to explain to them a, a new type of um, mechanism of disease or a new molecule that's been discovered. Um, or maybe you're new into the area and you really have to start the story from scratch. It really helps to be consistent. So uh, try to pick out your, your visual story, understand how you're going to depict each type of molecule that you, you need as part of your story, and then try to stick to a sim similar color palette. And that, that can then change when it moves into um, a promotional space, um, but try and be con consistent as much as you can, because as I said, the science is, uh, the, science is the same and having that stylistic um, baseline is really, really helpful. Um, you have the different touch points with um, also in medical affairs and also then maybe you've got your PR and communications uh, colleagues who are working with uh, investors and they also need to be able to understand the story as well. So lots of different types of audiences need to understand what they, they have, but it really helps if you keep that consistency so um, that everyone is comparing apples with apples and you're not leading them uh, into, a, into a, different, a different area. So um, I'm going to hand over, I think, now to Orla, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about how this applies to the, to the data. So Orla. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, there are three steps, really, that you must follow when you're looking to visualise your data. The first one um, is really to understand and have a clear purpose. So what's the question that you're trying to answer with this data? Um, and again, how do you put it into the context for your target audience? The next step, if you just build this out, is to look at what data then is go going to answer that question. And um, build. And then you can decide how best to present that data so that you can deliver the key message. What's the key finding? What's the key takeaway that you want somebody to get from this communication? Next slide. And if just build this out, we've been evolving over a period of time and improving over that period of time. And these are three posters uh, presented at ISMAP from 2018 to 2020. In the first one, you can see the question is very clearly articulated. Do corresponding authors value the support of professional medical writers? But I defy anyone on this call to pick out what the answer. There's too much information there. The answer doesn't stand out. The data is presented in different ways. It's not bad, but it just doesn't shout out. The middle one um, addresses the key point reasonably well, and the data shows in the middle. Um, so this is an improvement. There's less clutter on the page. There's more use of white space. There's more use of visuals to tell the story, but it still isn't 100% clear. The third one on the right from 2020 um, and answers the question very clearly and also announces the answer, which is yes. However, it doesn't uh, put that answer into context because it doesn't show the data. You've got to use the QR code to actually get the data to answer that question. So we're still evolving. And if we move to the next slide, really what we need to be doing is moving more to this situation where the data is the star of the show and the data tells the story and answers the question. Next slide. And I'm just going to use the COVID story really just to illustrate some points um, that might be quite nice takeaways for you during this call because the story around COVID and flattening the curve has evolved over time. This graph here is an adaptation from uh, one produced by the CDC, which was actually looking at the goals of community mitigation in the case of a flu pandemic. It looks very similar to us. We're all very similar to, familiar with seeing things like this for um, COVID, where it's very clear, no intervention. You have a high peak, then you have a lower peak if you introduce some controls and measures. 
However, on the next slide, you'll see that um, there was no real context there. It felt a bit ethereal. Um, so Drew Harris actually developed this curve. Um, he introduced the use of color, the red and the blue. But the most important thing on this curve is that he introduced that dotted line, which illustrates the healthcare system capacity. And therefore you need to flatten the curve so you don't overwhelm the healthcare system. So the message became very clear. However, just keep points to note on this is, no, the previous slide, points to note on this are that there's no title on this graph. The title on the slide is the title on the slide rather than on the graph. Um, but somehow you seem to know what it means, but there is no title. And I've not seen that um, wherever I've seen this graph. The other point is that when this graph was first shared, the blue curve here was a bit skew iffy. Um, and it almost looked cartoon like as if it was something that was done very, very quickly. But it's simple, uses color and the message stands out. And the next slide. The only thing was it wasn't quite accurate because even when you flatten the curve, you are still at risk of exceeding the capacity of the healthcare system. And that capacity varies depending on where you are. This um, adaptation is further work done by Carl Bergstrom and Esther Kim, where they introduced, not a, they introduced the concept of the flattened curve actually exceeding the healthcare capacity. Again, they've got very clear symbols on the graphs, and they also indicate here that control measures slow down the spread. There's a clear title on the graph, there's lots of use of white space, and they also further explain what is meant by control measures. So what it includes, hand washing, teleworking, et cetera. So there's a bit more context, a bit more information, and there's a bit more reflection of the fact. The next slide. And this further developed after a number of challenges actually that Carl and team had had. Um, so what's the point? The graph is the graph. Um, and we're going to have the same instance of the pandemic, regardless of whether we have a big peak or whether we flatten the curve and have um, a flatter peak. It's still the same volume under the curve. And that clearly wasn't correct. So the next evolution of this graph actually had the second graph at a much lower level. So the area under the curves are very different, um, highlighting the impact of immediate interventions using the red text there. Uh, but it also has the key elements like the dotted line indicating the healthcare capacity, the fact that, that healthcare capacity varies depending on what it is. But in addition to a title, there's also a call out here, which is proactive measures taken early, etc. So you can see the use of white space, color, um, shading, um, a strong message and a good title on the curve. The only thing I would set, suggest is maybe the axis could be knocked back a lighter gray because that almost isn't necessary. Um, and I kind of miss the red and the blue. So maybe that those colors should be reintroduced. So they'd be my only points on that one. And what happened next was that a number of different animations were built. So you could change the numbers, move the curve, et cetera. If we move to the next slide. But animations aren't always the answer. So this is an example. It's not the COVID one. This is an, another example of an animation used to illustrate um, obesity by age in the UK. So what's nice about this is that there's a visual representation of the data, there's the use of color, um, the key data are shown, it's dynamic and data driven, which means that you can change the data in the database underneath and that'll then reflect through. You have interactivity, so you can see those arrows on the right and the left. By clicking on those arrows, you can move around the dial to the different age groups. What um, isn't so good on this is that the data, if you do the build, doesn't necessarily stand out and it's not clear what the data is actually telling us. There's no key message coming from this other than illustrating that there are differences in, in age. Um, the, it, it's not quite clear whether the color is used on the person or actually is it the height that matters? Is it the volume that matters? It's not quite clear. And also there's no way of comparing between the ages because you have to switch from one age group to another age group. So you can't visually compare. So it would actually be better if they were presented on the same scale. If you're looking for people to compare data, they should be presented on the same scale and be visible at the same time. Because the objective really is to reduce the amount of mental work that your audience has to do to take away the key message from your data. And the next slide coming back to COVID, 
And if you just go through the build on this, um, illustrates quite nicely how you take away the work from your target audience. If you just go through the build. So this um, uses data from Public Health England to understand the, the, um, the impact really of the COVID restrictions in the UK and how that's impacting the population. And you can see here that the total population is nearly 70 million in the UK. The little black box down, the, uh, down in the middle on the left-hand side is the number of people who've died from COVID. The, the turquoise box then is the number of people hospitalized. And the orange box is the number of people who are currently living under restrictions in the UK. So you can see that um, very visually, you can see how all of these numbers stack up. Uh, relative to each other, making it quite easy for your target audience to put everything into context here. And next slide. Um, the, the, this slide here really tries to summarize everything that we have been talking about today. Um, and the first call to action really is that you need to write, continue writing, but do it clearly and succinctly. I saw a question come up in the Q&A about the use of active voice versus passive voice. I'm a fan of active voice. I certainly encourage people when they're doing e-learning modules and web content to use active voice. I think it's more succinct and gets to the point. I do think there is a tendency to use passive voice, which uses a lot more words partly because it's aligned with our politeness, um, but also it can be made to introduce some possibility um, that there are variants in the interpretation of, of what has been said. I, the other call to action is to visualize data to convey meaning and enhance understanding. Don't just visualize data for the sake of it. Everything that is visualized needs to be there for a purpose. It needs to make sense. You want the key data and the key message to shout out. Develop a consistent lexicon and imagery and visuals that can be used across the channels and throughout the product life cycle. Again, that'll reinforce, reinforce and reinforce and it'll make it much easier for people to understand what you are trying to communicate because it is done consistently throughout the life cycle. It also enables you to, um, to be more efficient because you're creating the visual style only once. It means that if you're creating visual elements, whether it be for a 3D animation or whether it be for uh, a, a 2D application, you could, if you know how you're going to use it later in the life cycle, you can build it in a way where it can be more easily repurposed, reused and recycled. So it means there's efficiencies in terms of speed and cost if you adopt that, that attitude. And I think that's all we have to say to you today. And, and we welcome any questions that there are from those participating. But you'll also see the list of references here um, that you can, you can find in the, in the presentation and that'll be on the video as well. Peter, Thanks, you're on. Ola. <laughs> okay classic classic okay i'm back with you okay sorry about that um okay thank you very much that was um, that was great loads of loads of information in there um and i suspect the q a we could go in several different directions um maybe all at the same time so uh, let's be a little bit careful but we've got 10 minutes or so to answer some questions from the audience audience members um you've got a couple of text boxes remember you've got your chat box and your q a box um, and I'd encourage you to send in any observations, comments, or questions that way. Um, can I can I start? I'm going I'm to kick this off, um, and 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 maybe this is more at the sort of the basic basic text like end of the spectrum, uh, communicating um, with reading material and so on. Um, I, I'm intrigued um, about the whole readability question. You you mentioned readability in one of your first graphs, um, Jason. Um, I know there's a number of tools out there. I know there's a number of, of views on how to, to assess readability and so on. Um, but I've also heard recently of a, of a client asking an agency to effectively use readability tools to, to sort of prove the quality of the, of the, of, of the deliverable, as it were. I, I just find that an interesting sort of area of discussion without going too far into it. Can you just give us, um, and I should say, we've actually, I might as well plug on Network Pharma TV. We've got a, we've got a, a video on, um, on readability from John Dixon, but from your points of views, just bring me up to speed on, on readability and your views on the tools and, and how useful they are in practice and how much you use them and how much you can really use it to measure the quality of a, 
article, as it were. Jason, can I start with you? Sure, I, I, I would never use it in isolation. It's a tool to help sort of direct a writer's writing just to make sure they're roughly in the right um, place when it comes to readability. But to use it in isolation would not be appropriate. I, I think being able to ultimately test it with the end user, who are, you, who are your audiences that you are targeting for this particular communication because they may be completely different depending upon the indication that you're talking to, depending upon whether it's obviously to patients or healthcare professionals. Um, yeah, between indications, you might have different age demographics, different uh, uh, levels of understanding. Um, it may be in a pediatric situation. So it, it, readability tools are nice to just gauge where you're going, but absolutely not the end, um, the, the only thing to use. And do, do you go out and test your materials with user groups? That, yes yes well we, we routinely or occasionally uh, or we we do occasionally and certainly when it's needed absolutely but for the most part you know when we're talking about lay um uh writing for lay audiences we find that testing it with our own colleagues who don't necessarily have a scientific background is very is absolutely sufficient and also our team of editors um are superb at picking up the nuances of, of language and being able to adapt uh, a writer's work who may be more uh, on a technical, um, have, have more technical experience there. Saying that, all writers that, uh, that work on plain language summaries, for example, have specific training to make sure that they are equipped and capable of working in that sort of area. Um, I know some groups do, some, uh, some companies, pharmaceutical companies do, um, recommend, if possible, that it's that, that um, work is tested with a, with a patient group, if possible, but it's not normally mandated. Okay, and and, and Katie, can I ask you from sort of the, mm. the, the pharma company side of point? I mean, how much how active are you in in, in going out and testing this stuff? Um, in terms of um, using readability software, I don't think we generally internally use it that much. Um, certainly for the company that I, where I work, we, we do have our own team, in-house team of medical writers. So uh, they may in some cases uh, use that kind of software. But I think as, as Jason was saying, you know, it, a lot of this is down to your craft and your experience. You know, medical writing is a craft about getting the information across in a clear and succinct way. Um, I think perhaps the, the challenge sometimes is when people don't have English as their mother tongue, how to make sure that that, that flow um, is clear and, and that you maintain the scientific accuracy. And perhaps also sometimes you need to consider what will happen to the material you're producing. So if it's a manuscript, then, then that's on one level. But if you're creating materials for a client that are going to be translated, the clearer they are in English, the better the chance you are that they're going to be, you have that they're going to be clear when they're translated into, into, another, into another language. Um, and certainly with regard to publication, plain language, summaries and I can see there's a, a question about target audiences there um, certainly um, we do work with different agencies um, for publication plain language summaries and in most cases they do have some methodology in place for checking that that language so that it is appropriate for the target audience um, and that target audience being the interested patient who would like to know more or perhaps the non expert so maybe you're in a complex therapy area that's difficult to understand and actually a publication plain language summary can really help a GP who may not be so familiar with that particular area of science or medicine um, and um, it gives them a, an, an easy to read um, brief overview um, that can that can be helpful so um, so yeah so we'd expect that readability for the the right reading age which is actually quite quite low um, would be checked by by the agency creating those materials Okay, so but, but there, uh, there is an interesting discussion or, 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 or area in there in terms of testing, you know, because we're all experts or we think we're experts, we write something, we think we've done it beautifully, but it's surprising how often, if you do go and ask the person that you've sent it to, they've missed the point also. And, and, but testing is not a routine part of 
our sort of work, is it? And, and I'm, I'm just leaving that hanging there as a mm. question. Maybe more could be done. I mean, a, a slightly related question. And all I'm going to bring you on, the, in the, on this one because I know you've got some views on it. But it was it's slightly related. It, it came in last night about the use of grammar, punctuation. Sorry, I should specifically, specifically talk about punctuation. Um, how important is punctuation effectively? Um, are, are we starting to lose the the interest in punctuation? And, but all just say a few words for that one because it was quite interesting having worked with you earlier about that. Yeah. Um... I think I'll caveat by this by saying that one of my favourite books was Eat Toots and Leave. So I do like a good apostrophe like everybody else. But I think it very much depends on the channel and the target audience. I think we can get too hung up on um, the, cr the correct use of punctuation and forget about the message. And particularly if you're using social media, that you are limited by the character count or the character count that's actually going to have any impact. So just think about your message. Don't worry too much about the punctuation would be my rule on it. And you will find there'll be plenty of exclamation marks, et cetera, in there to try and get the point across. Depending on what you're doing, you know, if you're doing a scientific presentation or whatever, get your punctuation right. It's, it's not that hard, but I think when you start moving to other channels, lighten up a little bit and get the message across. Right. Okay. Just out of interest, I mean, I'm smiling slightly as I'm listening to you to, to you talking there, and I don't know about anybody else in the audience, but you know, we're in a business which is very, very, very concerned about whether your comma's in the right place or not, sort of thing. Um, and I just, but, and, and everything's got to be signed off and approved by everybody. So if you start to lighten up your approach, do you run into lots of approval problems because somebody isn't going with you on that? Any comment? Um it's like my, my thing is, if, you're do, if you're doing if you're doing a scientific communication get the punctuation right mm. um, it's easy to dumb down afterwards but you start doing it correctly right. and then if you're tweeting about it or you're putting something up on social media about it that's when you can be a little bit more lax but the it's source also, material should be done correctly it's also about the style that you want to apply to you know and, and to talking to Katie's point of consistency a, a, across different materials if your style is going to be short and punchy statements that where the punctuation is you know really clipped um statements not necessarily full sentences then that's a style that, that would be built into your lexicon for example that you are applying across all of your materials for that product uh, and that may well be appropriate and therefore it's the consistency that matters and I think that very much applies in marketing materials, actually, Jason. You see, you see that used a lot in, in marketing materials. So, again, it's knowing your context, knowing your audience. But if it's a scientific communication, start with the grammar right, I would suggest. OK, OK. And just going off, I'm, I think I'm slightly picking up on a point. I think this is um, tangential to what you're saying, but related. Um, we, I think we've, what we've talked about in the visual communication stuff is fascinating these days. I spend quite a lot of time on that as well. But my, my question... Um, is it's specifically related to the fact that I think what we've been talking about, and maybe um, I'm missing the point, but the impression is we're talking about um, uh, marketing materials, scientific materials, sort of for the outside audience sort of thing. Mm. How, internally, and, and Katie, I guess I'm coming to you on this one, you know, how much do you bring those points about your consistency of message and visualization and so on into internal materials and how early? So does it get incorporated can it be incorporated right at the early stage with clinical research type activity and, and reports and so on? I just wonder yeah. within a company, how, how much of this is a marketing thing and how much of it is going back further than that? Well, I think, I think it's really important that we all start to, you start to think a little bit more creatively about how you get your message across, no matter where you work. So in the, so let's say for example, in the early stages of development, there are you, you usually have to go to some internal approval board to get funding for the next step in your program and every step of the way whether it's you know are we going to develop this this asset um you know what potential indications may it have uh, what clinical trial program are we going to develop to go along with that are we will this result in a submission all of those steps require some kind of approval from some kind of senior board who gives you the money and the resource to take that next step so you have to be um, you have to not just be solid in your science but you have to be able to get your message across because there may be a number of different assets in your portfolio 
and they need to be assessed based on you know is it is there a market is it worth developing that that compound further and you have to be able to make a case and so making a case in lots of written text loses your audience so internally you still have to be able to visualize you still have to be able to get your message across quickly um, and sometimes our senior management are, you know they, they have you know a lot of things to do and so they they have to be able to read um, pre-reads for, for meetings and get the message quickly and understand what it is that the team is is wanting to have and why they need funding for X, Y or Z um, clinical development program and what is it going to give at the end. So it's the visualisation piece is important no matter where you work. And I know of examples where um, data visualisation, a little bit like the one that Orla showed for COVID deaths versus number of people affected and at home. I know of, of a, a situation where visualisation similar to that was used by the FDA to get a point across around some data. So um, actually, even at that level, it's still really important that you visualize your data properly and that you can get that key take home message. Um, what I think sometimes we 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 let go a little bit um, internally where people are busy, we don't necessarily we don't have exactly perfect punctuation. We have some made up words sometimes and typos and things like that. They creep in in internal communications um, and internal slide decks because of the speed of which everything is, is moving. So um, I suppose for internal material, sometimes our bar is a little bit uh, lower in terms of that editorial control, um, which for those of us that work in medcoms or who have a, an agency history, um, we sort of throw our hands up in horror. But um, so like Orla said, you know, sometimes depending on the channel, you can be a little bit more relaxed. And so long as the message is, is, is clear and it's it's across, then, then that works. But of course, for materials that are going outside of the company or, have, or are being distributed very, very widely, then obviously things like punctuation, grammar, um, and making sure the imagery is, is, is correct is, is also really, really important. So we wouldn't send a, a, a manuscript off to, to a journal with, uh, with errors in it, hopefully. No, no, no. But I, I guess I'm going to come back to my basic point, which I was trying to get at, which was internally in a, in a, in a company like yours, um, you know, there's lots of common sense. You know, let's let's take your mode of action or your, your illustration yeah. of a molecule. Sign. Lots and lots of common sense behind let's have one and everyone yeah. use it. Yeah. Yeah. But we've all been involved in many, many situations yes. where that blindingly obvious common sense goes out the window because every single other person wants to do it their way. And if you yeah. get, you know, regions and countries and individuals yeah. and departments, I'm just trying, I, I suppose I'm stating that and you're nodding at me. So is that yeah. just okay? Or yeah. is that, uh, is, can you just give us a feel for how much of a challenge that is? It's in, a, in a huge, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a huge challenge. And because you have, maybe you're working on something in the global team, but maybe your first market that's going to launch is going to be in the US and they've already got their marketing team and they're super keen to get started on materials. So they say, oh, hey, we'll do a mode of action video. Well, that's great, but actually can you make it so that it can work for the rest of the world? And that's not always so easy to, to reverse engineer um, and things like um, you know how you start a mode of action video you know you can show something your molecule binds to a receptor that's lovely you show one receptor one molecule you show how it binds marvelous but if you suddenly show a field of receptors and every receptor has your molecule bound molecule bound to it then suddenly in the US you've made a claim because you're saying that our molecule binds to every available receptor and that's that's a, a claim in, in in the US so um, really trying to get all of those stakeholders at, together at the beginning to really understand what everyone is going to need at each step of the way can really help. Um, and I'm not saying that this is something that we do perfectly. It'd be interesting to hear if people have got good examples. Um, but to try and understand what touch points you have throughout the life cycle of the, the product, um, maybe you have discussions with investors, you have discussions with the, or you have, you know, first steps, proof of concept, something maybe um, in the company report, um, and then that creates a little bit of noise. So you need to be able to communicate externally. So actually you need to have that simple, um, simple drawings and simple messaging early on. Um, but then as that develops, then obviously your other touch points would be at medical congresses and uh, through sales materials and through our PR and communications colleagues. So, um, you know, don't turn up to a Congress with, you know, you're maybe working in, I don't know, asthma, for example, and you've got a few different molecules 
and then actually you've totally described airways or they're visualized completely differently between between two different mode of action videos it confuses the audience and at the end of the day they just see one company so the more you can be consistent the the more helpful it is to your audience in getting that that message across but very difficult to achieve because as you say people have different priorities at different times of the life cycle you don't always have the necessary resource available in those early stages um, to have the right people so medical communications experts who can really help to to align that lexicon and the the visualization piece as well so um, okay. important to get the right stakeholders together That's, okay uh, thank you I, i'm running I'm, we're running out of time a little bit yeah. so jason have you got you wanted to say a final comment on that and then for the purpose of the recording i'm going to wrap this up but people who are listening to us don't have to run away because we'll carry on going for 10 minutes jason you were trying to say something there thanks yeah i mean many of the folks online will be from an agency setting so i really see that as our responsibility to propose that to our clients you know yeah. sometimes um in an industry setting you may have the functions very in, in silos as, as katie mentioned but sometimes it's the agencies that span and support many of the different functions within a given organization so please everybody out there do put that forward to the people that you're working with to ensure that harmony across the different stakeholders that you work with. Okay. Okay, so guys. I'm, go I'm sorry. Oh, go on, Ola, go on. One final comment and then I'm going to stop, okay? I, I was just going to, there's a couple of comments there about um, bias and selling and data visualization. I think the best way of selling and data visualization is to give examples of good and bad data visualization. And there are a couple of papers out there which we can give you the link to. Um, which actually give examples and cheat sheets of the impact of uh, taking some data which is confusing and turning it into something which is clear. Okay. All right, guys, for the purpose of the recording, um, I'd like to draw a halt there. And as I say, to those people listening to us, don't run away because we can carry on going for 10 minutes yet. Um, but huge thank you to, to, to the three of you for the discussion. Very interesting. Lots of points that we covered there. Um, I'm, you know, I'm always interested in clarity of medical communications. I mean, the thing I want to say is the criticism I always get for these sorts of videos is, Peter, I haven't got time for 45 minutes to sit and watch this. You know, what's the two minute what's the two minute video? And you go, well, you can't do all this in two minutes. So there's a balance to be struck with all of this. Um, thank you very much. I'm gonna say uh, goodbye. I'm gonna make the point that all of you are happy to hear from people on LinkedIn. I'd encourage the audience and any viewers to um, to reach out to you and talk to you yeah. about these issues. Um, as a general point, um, I'm running these every Wednesday, these, um, uh, these webinars. Um, so come along to Network Pharma TV. If you've missed any, you find 250 odd uh, videos there. Everything I'm doing for Medcoms is basically at medcomsnetworking.com. So you'll find details of future um, webinars and other activities. There's a lot of different things going on. So um, to everybody, um, I wish you a good day. Uh, stay in touch and, um, and take care. But thank you very much. And I'd just like to have a wave from everybody these days because it's a bit of a thing now. So we'll just wave <laughs> and say goodbye. Bye bye.